Well, welcome uh, to another episode of Experiencing the Truth. Today, we're, we're talking about um, hell. That's such an encouraging topic to talk <laughs> about today. Yeah, well, it's not the it's not the Turner Burn type of message, uh, the fire and brimstone, uh, but we are talking about misconceptions uh, about you know, like the idea. This came from a lot of people think that you know I would rather go to hell than be in heaven with a bunch of boring goody two shoes. I would rather go to hell because that's where all the parties are happening. Yeah. So that's the that's the mindset and what. Um, we're going to be discussing oh, it. And I think it, I, I, it, what's interesting is it really does uh, go to the, the idea of well, how people see God. I mean, I think people believe God's kind of boring and dull and, and uh, it's, it's not so much the goody two shoes, but it's, he just doesn't know have fun, how to have fun and it isn't going to be fun in heaven. It's not going to be like, oh, I think that's part of the challenge is people think heaven is, uh, almost second place to the earth. Like living is way better. Living on earth is way better yeah. than heaven. Yeah. And and in reality, it's not the truth. That's not the truth. Heaven is far better than the earth. And heaven is really not our eternal destination. Mm-hmm. Revelation is pretty c- clear when it says that uh, there will be a new heaven and a new earth. So basically, uh, after we mess up God's heaven. Yeah. Uh, he's going to create an earth for which we live on and exist on. And so, you know, uh, there was a book that came out not too long ago called The Divine Revelation of Hell. Um, I don't know if you read about read it. Um, it, it, it's, it may be a longer time ago than, than I think it is, but it came out. It's, it was a pretty stark um, revelation of someone who... Uh, had died and had a revelation or a dream. I can't remember if they had died and had the revelation. They had the dream of a revelation of hell and how bad it really was. Mm -hmm. Um, Because most people, you know, when you die, it it, it was like I was talking to someone at a funeral we just did. They said, yeah, I hear that drowning is a very peaceful death. Well, uh, who, who, how does anyone know that? Like no one's, you know, how do you know that drowning's a peaceful death? I would think it would be horrifying, but, yeah. um, the, 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 the reality. And when you hear people say, uh, that they want to go party in hell, it, 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 it really is, a uh, uh, an ignorant, uh, they just don't know mm-hmm. what they're saying kind of statement. Yeah, there's a, I've heard it said, if you're a Christian living on this earth will be the closest thing you come to hell. But if you're a non-believer living this life here on earth is the closest thing you'll be to heaven. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it's, it's, it's the, it is the truth, you know, because, uh, death, hell is where death resides. I mean, if you, it's, it's interesting, all of those things that you hate about this world will be put in to, and and the reality is not even hell. Uh, Again, uh, to make a statement about hell, uh, and not understanding at all what it is just kind of, you know, I don't know, either as a joke or just throwing it out there to think it's going to be a party. Hell will be punished at the end days. You know, the the Bible's clear in Revelation. It says there is a great white throne Mm -hmm. and at the great white throne, death is judged. Mm -hmm. Death, hell, and the grave. So death. Such a cool thought. Hell (laughs) itself, all of hell, all the demons that reside there, Satan and every demonic uh, fallen angel and the grave, all those who have died without Christ, denying Christ and the sacrifice he made, will be judged at the great white throne. Mm-hmm. And they will be cast into the lake of fire. Hmm. And uh, so so there won't be people spending an eternity in hell. They'll be spending the eternity in the lake of fire. Yeah. And in Psalms, it's referred to as the sea of forgetfulness. Yeah, wow. And 
and the lake of fire and the sea of forgetfulness, which is incredible to me because God's all knowing. So he, he knows all things. Can God actually forget? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and there's some debate that the sea of forgetfulness is like this black hole of forgetfulness that God just wipes from his memory as though it never existed. If that's so, that is an incredible judgment. Um, uh, you know, I think hell, the, the closest thing that I can come to is hell in my mind is, you know, death is pretty bad when it's a death of a loved one. But when you're vomiting, uh, yeah, uncontrollably, oh my goodness, you just, I hate it. The only hope you have when you vomit is that hopefully this is a one day flu, right? Yeah. But imagine it never ending. And wow. there's no hope of it ending. Imagining, imagine for a moment that God doesn't even know you exist. Like you're in the sea of forgetfulness that everything and, and really the Bible says that your sins are thrown in the sea of forgetfulness or as far as the east is from the west in the sea of forgetfulness. Yeah. So is that suggesting that God forgets it? If it's true then those who go into the sea of forgetfulness or the lake of fire would be remembered. So you'd be suffering and no one would even know you're there. It'd be total forgetfulness. Wow. Now, that's hell. As though you don't exist. So is there, is there, this is what I've heard. I know a lot, like in my brain, you think that Satan is ruling over the people in hell. Like it's like, it's his dominion and then there's God's dominion in heaven. So in my mind and what it's been portrayed in movies that he's got the pitchfork, he's sitting on his throne, like in hell. And, but you know, it hell in, 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 even in Matthew 25, 41, it says, depart from me. You cursed into the, the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels, that yeah. this fire was not prepared for humans. It was prepared for the devil and his angels, meaning the devil is the one being punished as well. He's not, he doesn't have dominion uh, over that. So that with that being said, it's not like a group community that's suffering together. I've heard it says, said to be like, I, you're, you're in isolation because community is, is a part of God as well. And that you are suffering alone in your own like pain and regret and gnashing of teeth? Well, I think the only description we really have of what hell could be like currently is um, seen in the story that Jesus tells about Lazarus. Yeah. When he, he the, the Lazarus was the beggar outside of the rich man's house. They both die. Lazarus goes to Sheol. Sheol, before Christ died on the cross, when you died, all dead went down into Sheol. And why it was Sheol and not hell is because the righteous and the unrighteous went together to, to this place. But there was a great, and as Jesus tells the story, and really a lot of this comes back to that story, uh, when Jesus tells the story, it says that Abraham, who is evidence of a, a probably the father of Israel, yeah. uh, considered by his faith to be the most righteous, uh, was with Lazarus and the rich man yelled across the void. So you have some idea that there, that in hell there was this, this place where the unrighteous resided together and they yelled across this great vast void to Abraham. And they said, Abraham, please send someone back to tell them that this place exists so that my brothers don't go there. Wow. And, and what's interesting is wow. Jesus is telling this, no one had died, but he's giving us a, he, he kind of is giving us this look over into eternity of what it looks like that. And I'm sure even at that time in my day, people have been saying, let's go party in hell for generation and generation and generation. So it's nothing new, but, 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 and then Abraham said back, they have their prophets. They would not believe if even you came back from the dead to tell them they wow. wouldn't believe that hell exists or this place exists. Wow. So the reality is you may be able to tell them what hell is like and mm -hmm. how bad it is, but they just, they don't care. It's not a matter of them. They, they don't It's care. like in Isaiah where it talks about he is, and I was, I was just sharing with our, our media team about, you know, the verse in John 12, where it talks about the unbelief of the people and where this was what Isaiah prophesied 
um, saying that, you know, their hearts have been have been hardened and their eyes have been blinded to what the truth of God is so that they can't turn to God and be healed. Uh, that it's due to their unbelief and that they seen, like he was referring to, they, they'd seen my signs. I did all these mm-hmm. miracles. I raised a dude from the dead. And did you know, even then, Lazarus, when he was raised from the dead, this is something that's been blowing my mind recently, that the Pharisees, it says the authorities n- believed, but they still tried to, they plotted to kill Lazarus, the man that Jesus raised from the dead undeniable evidence that this was true and that this man had some validity. They still tried to put him to death acting irrationally because of their sin. They wanted to cover up because so many people were going to follow Jesus because of this man. There were still people. Yeah. I mean, they, they they weren't looking for the truth. They were looking for power and they wanted to do whatever it took to secure that power Mm -hmm. and influence. And, you know, our whole purpose of this is not to point you to us. This isn't, it's really to point you to the truth that there is a hell. Yeah. There's a heaven and there is a hell. And how do we know that Jesus who claimed to be God became flesh died on a cross, and then was resurrected from the dead. Yeah. Um, if you can tell me that you're going to die and be resurrected and then do it, <laughs> then I'll believe you. But until you're able to do that, I think I'll just trust Jesus and yeah, what he was exactly. saying and what he was doing. So that one, that that's... That's the reality of hell right there. We also have other people. There are other people in, in contemporary history that have had interaction with um, demons and even Satan himself, that Satan is a, beamy, uh, a being that will interact with human beings. I mean, if you look at the occult, there is no question that there are um, people who uh, operate in an anointing of Satan uh, as priests of Satan, and they have visitations with uh, the fallen angels and demons. and And if you're sitting there looking at listening to this and thinking, "Well, that's just craziness," well, friend, um, you're part of what most of the world would say is the most gullible nation in the world, the United States, uh, because we tend to believe um, crazy things. And then we don't believe actual (laughs) real things that are going on. If you don't think we're living in a spiritual world and the reality is if you believe we've evolved from, then you don't, you you can't believe in the spirit world. And that's exactly what the enemy would want you to do to deny that it even exists, but it exists and there is an abiding place and it's hell. And, um, it, it, and that's where you go When you die, if you do not have Jesus Christ in your life, you will go in the pit and and uh, and reside there until. um, Well, what happened was when Jesus died on the cross, we know that it said he descended down into Sheol. Yeah, that was. And he released the righteous from Sheol, Mm -hmm. and they were resurrected. In fact, some of them walked on the earth. People said they saw people. I was just at your funeral. Wasn't I just that? Didn't you just, you ever wondered, like, you you ever had celebrities and you ask your, didn't that celebrity die? Like you think, didn't Bob, it was just, didn't Bob Hope die? And yeah, he died. I think he died. And uh, and how, how would that mess up your mind? You're like, I thought I went to your funeral, but now you're walking. King on earth. Jesus unlocked the gate of hell and he released those who uh, were righteous by their Mm -hmm. faith. And then he preached to those who were still there that wanted to get out. They didn't want to hang out. They're like, why can't you take us? Why? And because they, they did not believe they were left in Sheol, which would later become hell because the righteous were uh, delivered from Sheol. Remember we were talking about this when we were on a life hex uh, shoot in Arizona at a, at a, a barbecue joint. And then we were talking about Sheol and I'm like, that's another thing. I'm like, I haven't, I've heard about it. It's also referred to as Hades if you look about it. But if you were to look up right now, click, click Google and you're like, I've never heard of Sheol. Look up verses on Sheol in the Bible and you'll get all these different scriptures. Like it's not an obscure thing. And even there was eyewitness accounts of people being raised 
uh, from that they were just, they were once buried and then they just started walking about when Jesus resurrected. Like this stuff is crazy. Like Jesus went down. I think it's such like an epic entrance. Like he busts down the doors. Uh, yeah. and, took and, the keys. Yeah. Like that's such a cool thought and went and ministered to the dead and where they were walking around on the earth. Like that is such a cool thought. And you know, when, when you talk, people think that the devil's their friend scripture, uh, would say otherwise, there's so many verses in the Bible where you look at what people thought to be freedom or life. Like we talked about the, I think it was the week prior we talked about is God the liar or was it Satan? And I think the way that you can look at that, because people will say, well, Satan's really trying to free us and uh, giving us freedom to be able to think for ourselves. God is the suppressive one uh, to keep our minds dull. But, you know, the best way to answer that is that same person that's probably judging God for not interacting with such an evil world. Well, the reason why it's evil and it's not perfection is because Satan punked uh, the original human beings into giving him the keys to this world. It also talks about that in John 12, how he had to be raised up to cast out the ruler of this world. Uh, And it also talks about in the commentary, it talks about it's so powerful when I was reading this, um, that basically Satan thinks that he's the prince of this world and has established himself uh, to be the king of this world. And Jesus came and took the reins back by defeating death. But the, the quit, the easiest way to tell like, Oh, well, Satan's the one that freed us. Look at the, look at, look at the, the byproduct each time he comes and, you know, frees your mind. It talks about in second Corinthians eleven three, but I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your mind somehow be, uh, might be led astray from the sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Then in acts five, three, uh, Peter confronts Ananias, Uh, by saying, how is the Satan, how has Satan filled uh, your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and kept uh, money for yourself? Uh, And he lied to the Holy Spirit and was ended up being uh, struck dead. Uh, And then in John 8, 44, uh, you belong to your father, uh, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. And when he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So that thought that heaven is a part, that hell is a party, it's who he is. He wants you to die with him. He wants you to taste death like he has. He's a murderer. It also refers to him as a thief. Jesus came bringing life. And this even idea or even concept or people are literally willingly saying, I would rather go to hell is just an identification of his character and what is. Yeah, I, I, I think some of that is almost trying to make bold statements. We live in a culture that just wants to make bold statements Edgy. again, you know, just let me just say, I would, you know, the, it, it, the, the reality is, um, you may believe if you're watching and you believe that right now, you believe hell is uh, a great place and that maybe we're deceived that heaven is not and that heaven's a place for, um, you know, uh, be, to be controlled by God and all of those things. If that's truly what you believe, um, there will be a day when you will come back and you'll say, you know what? Satan promised blessing and peace, but I never, I've never had peace. I've never had joy. The fruit of the spirit comes when you're rooted in Christ. So it is, Satan cannot, he does not have the ability to bless you. No. He does not have the ability to give you joy. He does not have the ability to give you peace. He is a liar. In fact, in Revelation, it talks about how the Antichrist is unable to take over the world and Satan and the Antichrist implode on one another. Like, Satan is the epitome of disunity. There is no unity in him. He, when you're self-serving and all you care about, and so you may go down that road and, and, and I would just say, you may think hell is going to be a party, but you're going to live hell on earth and you're not going to want to live it in eternity. If, if you want hell and you want to go party in hell, you're going to do that on earth. And then you're going to discover the end of that party there's a hangover, mm-hmm. except in hell, it never ends. 
it, the, the hangover never ends. You know, it's described, the Bible describes hell as darkness, uh, a gnashing of teeth that doesn't sound good, fire uh, that burns, separation from God, and and just hopeless. There's no future. It doesn't change. You know, Alex, there there is a, a number of Christian, um, at least I, I, I think they're Christians, um, but there are some speakers, authors. In fact, one of the most notable one is the one who wrote the book, The Shack, who yeah, really good. believes yeah. that um, hell is not permanent that hell is nothing more than detention. And based on how evil you are on earth, you serve time. It's like prison. You serve time and eternity. And then once you serve your time, you'll be released into uh, heaven. And um, I would would say that's a great, and quite frankly, I love that theology. I think it's great. I do not like the thought of people spending an eternity in hell. And if you like the thought of that friend, if you like the thought of people spending an eternity in hell, you need to meet Jesus because you don't know him. You do not share his heart. You, that is, if, if you, if you want people to spend an eternity in hell, then you are living at the spirit of the very thing the very one that lives in hell Mm -hmm. because the heart of Jesus for God so loved the world Mm -hmm. that he gave his son. So people would not need to go to hell Mm -hmm. that we could be free from hell. It's like a, you know, you see it a lot of times in the Bible, the most like, you know, the legends and and the faith with, um, you see it with, uh, Moses, where he pleads for the Israelite Israelites forgiveness because God was ready to smite them uh, due to their disobedience and then gives asks for God to take his life. Instead, you see it with Abraham uh, pleading with the life of the people in Sodom and Gomorrah by saying, that if there's if there's 25 righteous men, if there is X amount of righteous men, will you spare them? And you see it with Paul. Uh, one of the greatest, you know, missionaries I see like in you know, an amazing communicator of the gospel and defender of the faith he, saying that he would rather uh, be cut off from Christ than see his brothers like go to hell. Like he would rather swap places uh, with him, with them. Like that is the heart, not that this, and this is, this is where I think hell needs, should be talked about more because it's a sobering reality. That's why it also says in the scripture where it's better to be in a house of mourning than a house of feasting and celebration, because that's our end goal, that just like how we were all born, we all have like a day where we celebrate our birthday. There's a time where we're going to die and give an account of the life that we lived. Uh, But it's something that we would rather um, busy ourselves um, with things and material possessions and busy our schedules and and things that bring us comfort because it's a thought that we don't want to think about. But I think when we do, it it changes the way we live and gives us, um, you know, a pursuit of lost people that have this mindset. Like, do you know, it's not about fear or manipulation, but this is like a sobering reality. and, and, And I need to finish that thought. I love that theology, but there's nothing in the Bible Mm -hmm. that says you're going to get parole out of hell or released from hell. There's nothing, nothing in the scriptures, nothing in the religious leaders, nothing in the Christian tradition that says that this is all, it sounds good to me now. And, and I just think that's, what's going to happen to it. So it's to them that, that they're going to get free. Quite frankly, in what you were just saying, that's why we're so desperate to share the truth with people who hear. Yeah. And, and just as Abraham said to the, the one who was in the rich man that was in hell, and yeah. he said, we could send back the dead and they're not going to listen. Um, in Revelation Right before the battle of Armageddon, Jesus comes Mm. back and personally preaches to those that are there and says, please repent, turn in your thinking, 
serve me. I don't want this to happen to you. And this is three days before the battle of Armageddon. And Mm -hmm. after all of the plagues of the tribulation and everything, and Jesus comes and preaches to try to rescue people. Wow. God is not trying to send people to hell. <laughs> he could if he wanted to. Yeah. He, he's not trying to destroy mankind. He's trying to save mankind. What he's sending to the lake of fire. And people say, well, I don't believe God will send anybody to hell. Um, no, we make that decision. We were yeah. born on the path to hell. He said his yeah. son in the path. You have mm-hmm. to step over his son in order to get to hell. Mm-hmm. And and it's not you he's sending. It's your sin that you won't let go of. It's yeah. the sin that you claim is your own. And when you make a statement, we're going to party in hell, essentially what you're saying is I don't need a savior. And 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 I'm not, I don't think I'm a sinner. I think all of the things that I want to do is just perfectly fine. Mm-hmm. And yet all of the problems we have in the world, the things that, you despise the most. I promise you, the things you despise the most in the world all come back to sin. Mm -hmm. Death comes back to selfishness, comes back to those things that came about because we don't care about other people. And and that's what hell will be. Mm -hmm. It will be a place where selfishness is concentrated, where fulfilling our lust is concentrated where everyone will be out for themselves. And, and for Satan, Mm -hmm. some believe that in, in some respects, the lake of fire may be also a place of a pit where there's constant falling. And when you're in a constant free fall, now, I don't know if this is true. There's not much I have there. I know Satan will be in a bottomless pit, which means you're just falling because when there's no bottom, you can't hit bottom. So Satan will be placed in a pit where perpetual falling, which means there's nothing, there's nothing stable. It's endless that, that I can't even, if that doesn't make you want to go out and uh, share the love of Jesus with people, um, then I don't know. Nothing will, nothing will. When you think of it, eternity of that. Yeah, there's. There's a thing that's real simple. It says for the wages of sin is death. So if I were to work at, I used to work at finish line. uh, And at the end of the, you know, the two weeks, my pay period, I got a check for the work that I did. We get this concept. Uh, We live in capitalist America. Like this is, this is what you do. You get what you pay for. Now, if you live this life for the wages of your sin, the way you live your life right now, apart from Jesus those that those wages that you are going to um, receive at the end of your life, that pay period is the end of your life, that those wages that you receive will be death. But and that's something that is destined for everybody until Jesus stepped in and was the stumbling block and and and, and took us away from that, you know, uh, that pay period. But the gift of God, it says, is eternal life. The second half of that verse is the gift of God is eternal life. It was something that we didn't earn. It wasn't wages. It was nothing that we could earn. It was a gift from God and he gave us eternal life. Sin came and the devil came giving us lies and and freedom of, of thought and thinking what we thought, but it led to death and Jesus intervened and gave us and gave us life. And I... That's, that's the easiest way to put it. Like sin is not your friend. It's all like it says in the Bible too, that we're sons of disobedience. We're also sons of Satan. And that's why we need to be born again. I think I was talking to someone about that and he was like, you know, I've never, actually never heard of that. Cause we just say we're all children of God, which is true. Um, but because of Adam, we have this sin, this, this sin has been passed down and he was a doctor. So it was fun to be able to explain. It's like, you know, we have like an X and Y chromosome and we have different, um, I was trying to remember hereditary type stuff and you guys will make fun of me, the smart people that are watching right now. And I was trying to describe it to him, but he was going down he was getting all nerdy on me and he's like, Oh yeah, it's, it's like, we have an X and Y chromosome. One's given from our mom and one's given from our dad. Um, and Jesus well, and life, was, you know, moms make this statement. I gave you life and I can take it away. Actually, yeah. it's the father that gives yeah. life. It's the blood. It comes through the bloodline of the father. The mm-hmm. mother nurtures that 
life, Mm -hmm. but the father is actually the one that gives the child life in the womb of the mother. And it's crazy. There is, um, you know, this is the, this is the crazy thought with all of this. Um, and the gospel, the, my favorite part of the gospel where it talks about in Romans and Galatians that kind of puts this together and, and how, cause we all just say, oh, we're children of God or whatever. Right. But what's the reason why we have to be born again? Just like Adam didn't have a father, like there was no like physical father. It was God who created him. He chose death. And because he chose death, there was death in all of us. Jesus was the true Adam, the second coming of that. And his father was not a man, but it was God. And so he was part man. He was, he was fully God and fully man. And because he sacrificed himself and and giving away the wages that he deserved, which was life and took on the punishment we deserved, which was death. He did a little swap for us. And now when we believe in him, we receive life. Like by our faith in Jesus and believing in him, there's this hereditary swap where we take on a whole different like gene, which is life. But in us right now, unless you believe in Jesus, you have sin inside of you and you're a son of disobedience. Like we said, your father, he talks about is a murderer and he's been a murderer from the beginning. There's a change of thinking and a belief in Jesus that needs to take place and to be born again, putting away right. itself. Well, let, let's, uh, let's move us back to hell since that's our topic and that's good. <laughs> Amen. Um, <laughs> uh, another, uh, thinking that you'll hear often is that, um, yes, it's true. There is a hell and yes, people who do not have Jesus in their heart or believe in Christ and confess with their mouth that are not saved will go to hell, but they will, they, they, they but it's death. It's an eternal death. And it, and there's a part in there where it talks about it being an eternal death, but, but their idea of death is the ceasing of existence. Like yeah. when you die, your body dies. They no longer exist on the planet. In reality, that's not even true. They do exist. You bury them in a, a tomb. They they exist. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that we that will be the case. In fact, uh, contrary to that, you were created to be an eternal being. Hmm. You were created to be. Your soul is an eternal soul. You were given a spirit man. So in the garden of Eden, you're, you were, when Adam and Eve were created, they were created to live forever. Mm -hmm. They had an alpha, but they had no omega. Mm -hmm. They were going to exist forever and ever and ever on earth. That was God's plan. Yeah. Which means you have an eternal soul. The Bible says that if you eat of the tree, which they did, you Mm -hmm. will surely die. Well, what died? They were created in the image of God. They had a body, they had a soul, and they had a spirit. In that moment, their ability to connect to God, their spirit man died. Life comes through Christ. Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and life. It comes through Christ. When you come back to Christ, you are never more like Christ than when you come back to Christ and you connect to him. But that soul never cease to exist. That's why when your body dies, your soul is present the Lord. That um, when you're absent from your body, you're present with the Lord. Means mm-hmm. your soul lives forever. There is no end to your, to, for your soul. So where your soul ends up is an extremely important thing. And nothing in scripture contradicts the eternal nature of your soul when we go through it. And so it's another argument, I think, because we have such a hard time believing that somebody would spend an eternity like we can understand a thousand or base. You're just paying for what you did on earth. You did mm-hmm. bad. You deserve a thousand. But the, but the Bible says if you've committed one, it's as though you've committed them all. Yeah. If you commit one sin, it's as though you've done all of the sins. Uh, it's the, it, it, again and again, the Bible says, if you've broken one, you need a savior to redeem you from the one. It doesn't say that serving time in hell redeems you from your sin Not so once. that you can spend eternity in heaven. Jesus never talks about it. 
Paul never talks about it. None of the prophets talk about it. It is nowhere in the Bible. So I think there's some theology that's really created out of this emotional desire for things. And it's easy to buy into because we want to believe it's true. I want to believe it's true. I understand. Um, I, you know, the thought of that just is crazy. And you want to believe mm-hmm. that it's true. But there is really no scriptural um, uh, uh, support for it. Yeah, Second Thess- Thessalonians for, uh, one nine says they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and the glory of His might. And in uh, where is it? Matthew. Uh, it talks about in twenty five forty one. Then He will say to those on His left, "Depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire." Again, prepared for the devil and his angels. Uh, and again, when it talks about for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. Every time it refers to life and or death, it talks about, you know, and here in Revelations 20, 10, it says, and the devil who was, who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beasts and the false prophet were. And they were both, they will be tormented both day and night forever and ever. And There's ever. never, uh, you know, with life and death, how it talks about in the Bible and you can try telling me where it is, uh, it talks about there not being an ending, whether it was the reward or the destruction part of it. It, it says eternal. And what does eternal mean? And there's no like time clock or where you punch out. So it would be a nice thought. And I think when things so harshly disagree with things in us, we throw it out. And so that's where we dance on the line of moral relativity, like progressive Christians do. Um, where we have to be careful. It's like, no, well, what, where do your beliefs line up with scripture? And anybody who's ever taught this from the early Christians in the early 300s or the founding fathers, and like, you know, where does that line up with scripture and what was taught or even out of Jesus's mouth? Well, and, and, and Christians are like, well, I just don't think that people should have to suffer through that. That's why Jesus came and died yeah. on the cross. Yeah. He gave an out for people to get out of that. But you're saying, but what if they don't want Jesus? <laughs> what they're essentially saying is statements like I would want a party in hell. I want hell. They're begging for hell. They're, they're going to get what they want is Mm -hmm. hell. And we're like, yeah, but I don't think they should have to suffer the consequences. And that is the mentality that we live in today, not just in this deal, but in just pure lawlessness. Um, where there's this mentality and we'll talk about this in next week's podcast. I want to talk about the, 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 uh, the position of the law in a the church of grace hmm. um, because <clears throat> we have like if we if we if we throw out the entire law what you now possess is lawlessness mm-hmm. and God never intended his son to bring lawlessness and the enemy has deceived many believers to think because we're saved by grace, which is an incredible thing Mm -hmm. in and of itself, praise the Lord, because we're saved by grace, we no longer need to live by laws, like laws aren't important anymore. And what that lends itself to is lawlessness, where people end up doing anything they want to do. It leads them down that road. And, 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 um, and I think that changes our thinking so that when we look at hell, we have a hard time reconciling the fact that there is one way to eat, to eternal life. And that's Jesus Christ. Yeah. There is no other way. And we can't console our minds because we're not telling people that we don't want to tell people that. Um, so we, we try to console our minds that, well, they may go, but it only be for a little bit or they may go, but it's, they're not going to exist forever. They may yeah. go and, and, and you have to rewrite the Bible or rewrite scripture or rewrite what Jesus said to, in order to console your mind that, that they're going to be okay it's, with that. It's hard to, cause you know, um, you see a lot of times when you know people that aren't even Christian necessarily, it's like fly high or like you're an angel or like, you know, like look out for me up there and, and stuff like that. It's, it's like a sad thought. Cause obviously you would never confront anybody and be like, well, actually 
but it's true. It's a lie that we believe that brings us comfort to those. But reality and the hard truth is that if they didn't believe in Jesus, they're, they're not in heaven. And that's a scary thought. That's actually a thought that led Francis Chan to be as passionate of his pursuit of Christ and reaching people was like his grandma had, had died. I can't remember it specifically, but his grandma had died uh, rejecting Christ. And he's like, that's a terrible thought to think of like my family members that don't believe the people that I love and they're, they're not going to be in heaven, which is a terrible thought for you. Even coming out of my mouth, it's like you get acid reflux. It's like, Oh, I'm yeah. going to get like a flag well, on this it, it, YouTube. And, and when you think of hell, it's funny how people who say they don't believe in God, don't believe in the Bible, they say, oh, we're going to go. They don't even, they, like hell is a concept that was really brought into reality yeah. by uh, the Jewish people hmm. the, to identify that there was a hell and there is a heaven or a Sheol, yeah. a place where people go when they die. And, and there was always an argument between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, whether or not there was life after death. And, yeah. and Jesus came and said, yes, there is a resurrection. Paul, mm-hmm. Paul identified that as well, that there was a resurrection. But, but because we know about hell, I want to, I want to just clarify again, what is hell really like? And I'm going to give you some verses. Uh, and so, so that this is a, biblical description of hell, mm-hmm. not, not my description. One, it's darkness. Um, the Job, which is the oldest book, describes it as uh, the land of the deepest night, utter darkness. Uh, Nahum 1.8 says the realm of darkness. Uh, Matthew 25.30 calls it uh, thrown outside into the darkness. Jude one thirteen says the blackest darkness and revelation 16 10 says plunged into darkness so Uh it is a very dark place and and uh if you don't think if you think darkness is fun uh go and this is interesting we were in arizona we went into a gold mine and and they put the they they gave you a candle and you went down in the mine and they said okay we're gonna blow out the candle it's pretty eerie when you can't even see your hand in front of you. Yeah. You can't move. You don't know what you're going to hit. You you can't see anyone around you. It's wow. disorientating. It It's not a very pleasant experience. In fact, you're like, okay, let's get the lights back on. Yeah. We're drawn. Things. Yeah, we're drawn to light. The next one is gnashing of teeth. Um that and this is mentioned so many times in the Bible, the gnashing of teeth, um, and and you see this, you'll see these scriptures in Matthew eight twelve and Matthew thirteen fifty, Matthew twenty two, Matthew twenty four, twenty five. It refers to it as that fire that there is fire and. In hell, and I think most people equate hell with fire. They call yeah. hell's fire. Uh, Matthew thirteen says blazing furnace. Matthew five says a fire of hell. Matthew eighteen says eternal fire. Uh, Mark nine says the unquenchable fire. And Revelation four says tormented with fire and brimstone. And this is the one I think which is the worst: fire, darkness, gnashing of teeth. Uh, people will probably say, oh, that's terrible, but this is really the worst. And even as an unbeliever, I don't think unbelievers realize that they walk. If you're sitting here and saying, I don't believe in God, I believe God, we came from monkeys. I don't believe um, that God exists. Um, and, And of course, I disagree with that. But can I tell you something? You don't need to believe to live in the presence of God. Yeah. Like you're living in a planet with all the evil around. You're living in a planet where God still has providence, where God is present. Hell is a place where we're complete. You're completely separated from anything that is God And you live around and you say, well, I don't believe in it. Well, you live around people who do. And you are blessed more from those who believe in God than you realize. Mm -hmm. And you say, well, I don't believe that's possible. Well, Joseph uh, blessed, Potiphar was blessed because Joseph was in his life. Mm -hmm. 
um, wherever the, the Ark of the Covenant, which was the symbol of God's presence was, David brought it back to the city because in the home it was in, that home was blessed because the presence of God was there. You don't have to be a believer to be blessed by the presence of God or people who believe in the presence of God. But hell is a place where you're completely and totally separated from God. Second Thessalonians 1 9 says, shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Matthew 25 41 says, depart from me. You are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. You just read that. And then Matthew 25, 46, then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous eternal life, meaning they will be separated from the very temples of the Holy Ghost, which are believers in Christ. They will no longer have community with them and, and in turn not experience any of the blessing that they get to share in because they're standing along with them and then the community of Christ. And, and I think a lot of people believe, well, I'm blessed and I don't serve the Lord. You're blessed because you're in the community of people who are blessed yeah. and you're getting the residue of that blessing on your life. Yeah. And, um, this was a verse that was just, you know, it was, it was one of those verses that you, you get that aha moment. And for me, it was like, you know, when someone does wrong to you, uh, I was walking someone through this. It's, um, you know, we're chill. It, the, and the verse was talking about your chill. You, we reflect our father um, by, you know, giving grace to those who are our enemies and loving our enemies. But the crazy thing where you say, you know, the wicked that are here on earth and they complain about God and how this is terrible and this and that, but they still experience the blessing of being here on this earth. In Matthew 5, 45, it says he causes his son to his son which is crazy, like S-U-N, his <laughs> son, to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and unrighteous, mm -hmm. that it isn't a direct representation of like, you know, karma, where those who do good receive good and those who do bad receive bad, that he gives grace to both, which is insane, not by merit. And, you know, when you're completely removed from all things that this is his creation here on earth and you're removed from that, that's a scary thought, like you had mentioned. Like, just try to think about that. That's his son. The, the light comes from him. And to be separate from all those things, like, like we talked about, you being on earth and not having belief in Christ is going to be the, this life is going to be the closest thing you'll experience to heaven. Even if you lived a terrible, like horrible life, closest thing you, you'll come to heaven uh, but for us, us Christians, this will be the closest thing you come to hell. And that's an insane thought for the unbeliever and why, you know, this needs to be communicated. God has, we talk about in revelation and, and his patience and even his patience to let his son rise on the evil and sends rain like to the unjust, like his patience and his grace is so hard to comprehend. And it's you know, that's an uncomforting thought. Like we don't get what we deserve and he is not an evil God wanting to just smite people on the top of the head because you know how easy for him that could be if he really wanted to do that. If you believe that he's God, let's just say he's up there and you don't, you don't question that there's a God. You just question his character. Well, if, if he is an all powerful God, don't you think that it'd be pretty easy to take out a worm like one of us, like a little speck, just to say your life is over or to punish us here on earth? Like his, that's not his heart to do, because if it was, we'd already be dead. Well, and, and, you know, the, the argument is that, that you started with is people say, well, he's such a controlling God. Yeah. Well, if he was a controlling God, don't you think there would be a whole lot of things he wouldn't have allowed? Yeah. He allowed because of free will. He's yeah. he's not controlling. He is he has placed us here to be stewards and given us the ability to make decisions. Mm -hmm. And what we're going through is not because God um, did it. It's because we did it to ourselves. Yeah. Um, in, in all of this. And so, you know, it's, it's amazing to think, um, you know, God is merciful. He's been very merciful yeah. to us. And, and, um, I just 
forgot what I was going to go where I was going to go with that. <laughs> the but, sea of forgetfulness, baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the sea. It's in the sea of forgetfulness. I think so. Yeah. No, there's, there's. We could go on and on and on, and I think this might need to be broken up. You know, later on where we cover more. So if you guys got questions about this. We talked about Sheol. That's a whole podcast in and of itself and Jesus busting down the doors of hell. Um, But there's a lot to unpack here. But for you to get across one, I would say to the believer listening to this, how are you living your life to reach those around you? If you truly did uh, have the it's like having the cure for cancer and you don't tell your friend that's dying, uh, you know, a very painful death. Uh, and you have the, the, you know, the solution all along, how terrible of a person would you be? Now that's just making it practical. You know, this is what, like the mindset I think we got to carry with everything you just learned today. How is that going to change your life, uh, to those around you? Those, those people that are unbelievers, um, you know, and I'd say to the person also that thinks it's going to be a party in hell, I would encourage you not to play Russian roulette with your eternity, that if you truly think that's what it's going to, it's going to be, you know, look at other religions, see what they say about it. Look at Christianity and see what the Bible says about it. Uh, Because I think that you are being deceived of by the father of lies who is a murderer and hates you and don't get punked into giving away your you know, your right to, to eternal life that Jesus had already bought and purchased for you. You just haven't gone, uh, to pick it up from the store. Like don't be punked out of your reward and your gift, uh, because you have an issue with this character. God has incredible patience. And even though you don't believe in him, the sun still rose and, and, and there's not a, a eternal rain cloud over you. And, and you have, you have blessing right now. So don't take that for granted or get fooled into giving this, this gift of eternal life away because you have an issue with his character. Yeah. The, so I remembered what it was. I pulled it out of the sea of almost forgetfulness. <laughs> um, you know, there are many people who have experienced the protect, protection and mercy of God. Mm. And he's merciful in a situation where people could, are that close from going into eternity. Yeah. And, and I, I want to tell you, if you know someone who is not saved, I'm going to ask and, and I want to encourage you to pray for them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Prayer will keep them alive yeah. until they come to the revelation yeah. of who Christ is. That's good. And, and there are a number of wow. people who have experienced the mercy of God in their life and wow. said, I could have da- died, I should have died, but mm-hmm. I didn't die because... People were praying for you, whether a grandmother and mom, moms and wow. grandmothers are probably the most powerful of all of them, but they lift you up and say, God, will you save them? And, and when a mama asks mm-hmm. for a baby, there's nothing that shakes the heart of God more than just saying, wow. I'm going to, I'm going to step in and keep them alive to give wow. them another opportunity That's to experience my grace, to experience, because God does not want yeah. you to go to hell because hell exists Mm -hmm. and an argument isn't going to get you to believe this. You can read the book, divine Mm -hmm. revelation of hell. And even after reading that, it may put a little shake in your bones and a little fear in your driving, but it isn't going to change your heart. You don't come to Christ because of fear. You come to Christ because of love. Yeah. You come to Christ because you have a divine revelation mm-hmm. of his love for your life and and he plucks you from hell. And the sad part is people when they say I just I want to go party in hell. I want to go they really don't know how much God loves them wow. and 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 when you know his love you'll mm-hmm. turn your attention to him and yeah. and you'll look to him. I always say this if, if my wife, if my father-in-law had said to me, well, you can either marry my daughter or I'm going to shoot you. <laughs> How many know I'd probably have said, well, my wife's an incredibly beautiful woman anyway, but it wasn't hard. It would have been easy to say that. And I, and, and I did, uh, you know, I love her, but I would have, if, if in that moment I didn't love her and he said that I would have married her out of fear of my life. 
how many know that my relationship with my wife would have been pretty dysfunctional? Yeah. Because I didn't marry her because I loved her. I married her because I didn't want to go to hell. Friend, we don't follow Jesus because we don't want to go to hell. This isn't fire insurance. I didn't give my life to Christ because I didn't want to go to hell. I gave my life to Christ because he first loved me. Yep, that's it. And because of that love and experiencing the revelation of his love for me, I have peace. Mm -hmm. I have joy. I have wisdom. I have uh, understanding beyond my years. I have favor I didn't earn. Mm -hmm. There are so many things that he has placed into my life. Yeah that I didn't have before. Yeah. And it, this is so much greater hmm. than hell yeah. and whether or not it exists of which it does. Yeah. It's so funny. Like I'm, I'm like super pumped up right now. It's so funny that, a, you know, a podcast on hell is making me want to go out and just go tell someone about Jesus or just like get on my knees and be like, God, you're so good. Like legit. Hell, hell. And I, and I say this people, when I would preach on it, people would say, Ah, oh, man, a message on hell. And I said, it's the greatest love story ever told. Yeah. It's the greatest love story ever told mm-hmm. about how we get rescued from it. Yeah, because you think that he, it's like a, we have this manipulation mindset. But, you know, to close it off, the this is the something that Paul talks about. He says um, his kindness has led us to repentance, that it was God's kindness, his patience that has led us to repentance, not, not people's manipulation. And we're not trying to preach fear and fire and brimstone, but if you have an accurate view of your father and you recognize what he truly did, it's something that's just earth shattering where you take the, the glasses off and you're wow. Or it's like when your parents, you know, you learn something. It's like that that interesting fun fact about your family that your parents had sheltered you from and you have that, it could be like a negative. Oh, like I didn't realize that's why, why you protected me the way you did. It's like a, it's like that revelation, but you know, in a good sense where you, the glasses come off and you see a totally different perspective other than what people just tell you who he is. And you totally understand what Christ has done and that this whole time he's given you patience and and he's still been kind to you, even though you could have died in your sin and transgression that he, he gave you an opportunity to follow him and had sent his son previously before you even were born as a gift that has already been given to you. It's, it's such a crazy thought when you, when you start to think about that, it's, it shakes you, but until you truly do believe, um, you're going to struggle. you like, I, I'm going to, I'm going to pray for you guys, um, that you would have that encounter with Jesus because I realize, you know, God's been working on me that it's not human persuasion that leads to people's like revelation. It's, it's, uh, it's God who does that. I, I'm here to collect the harvest. Like God, what you can do what only you can do in the miracle of pro- providing that revelation and who he is. When Peter says you are the Christ, the son of the living God in Matthew 16, 16, Jesus recognized that his father was the one that revealed it to him. Um, and that's what the father has to do for you. And if you, if you are humble and ask, he will reveal himself to you. But the thing is pride gets in our way. And keeps us from God because God opposes the proud. I, I, I pray for you guys. I, I'll, we'll, we'll pray right now. I feel like we got to, in this type of podcast, you want to close it out in prayer and pray for those that are watching it. It feels weird. I'm like, it's so weird. I'm like in a weird spot right now. I'm like, I'm like super emotional right now. I feel like this is like a call to salvation uh, type of message. So we're, I'm going to just, we're going to just do this right now. If you're watching on the other side of the screen, uh, you're listening to this right now, whether you are, Uh, kind of been in a lukewarm faith, or this is your first time hearing about the goodness of God and you're open to it. That's what we're going to pray for right now. So Pastor James. Why don't you go and do it, my brother? You you got it. All right. God, I thank you for everyone that's that's listening to this or watching on the other side of the screen Mm -hmm. right now. God, they might not even know who you are. They might not have even grown up in church or even been able to develop misconceptions because they just never have heard about this. God, I pray that you would show them Mm -hmm. who you are. 
not what the world has shown them or what they heard about or read about from a secondary source. Father, your presence is alive today. And regardless of whatever time they're watching this, I pray that your presence as yes. under the sound of my voice would come into that space where they are right now and they would encounter the peace and love uh, that you provide. You say you bring peace, not that the world gives, God, and I pray for that peace to rest on them. God, I pray that they would encounter that and would that be a sign that this God is real. I've tested everything else and everything else is this constant falling like we talked about, that, that there's no firm foundation in it. God, I pray that they would find the only foundation in peace to this life, which is your son, Jesus Christ, who saved us from the grave and gave us eternal life. God, right now, I pray that they would, they would accept that truth and all lies would be silenced by the mouth of the enemy that would try to murder them and lead them to death. God, I pray that your voice right now would overwhelm their heart, that they can't help but just give their life to you. And it's out of love, Jesus. God, I pray this in your name. Yes, Lord. Amen. Amen. And if you made that decision uh, today and you prayed that with me and you came into agreement, this is not where it ends. I want you guys to, uh, the, the second part of that is community and, you know, having someone to walk alongside you in this journey of faith. We're not here to just abandon you and, all right, go try it on your own. Uh, we want to have a relationship with you. One way you can do that is email me at Pastor Alex at Bethelsrock.org. Uh, or you can click the link. We always put a link in our comments where if you click it, uh, the online connect card, you will be able to fill that out. I will get your information. It'll give me a, uh, right when you fill it out, I'll get a confirmation and I will reach out to you by giving you a call and following up with an email or text or whatever I got to do. But you're, you belong you're, you're created to be in community and you weren't meant to do this life alone. So I encourage you, if you have questions even too, you disagree with it, send it, send me an email. Um, and we want to start the relationship with you guys. If you made that decision, there is, you know, a celebration going on in heaven as we speak. This is, you know, this is a life changing thing. Mm -hmm. It's not a small decision, but anyways, we got to cut this off at some point. Otherwise we're going to be going on like on two hours here. Uh, but we love you guys. Um, you know, this is, we, we get to do this. We're not coming with, you know, like, uh, with a prideful approach, but this is our heart for you to know who Jesus is and you to experience the truth. We love you guys and we'll see you guys next week.